<laughs> well, good morning, church. Good morning. good morning. It is awesome to be here today. We have refreshment going on outside. God's given us a little bit more water to take care of the drought situation that we've been in for the last few years. So um, even though it's wet and kind of drizzly and dreary outside, it's still a great day because this is the day that the Lord created. We need to rejoice and be glad in it. So good morning and welcome to Grace Street Church. If you're online and you're watching us today, please say hi so that we know you're online with us this morning. And uh, we welcome you here. And if you ever feel like uh, joining us in, in person, feel free. We'd love to have you here. Uh, it's always good to be in the fellowship of other Christians and, and be able to just uh, fellowship with one another and, and get to know each other. Well, this Wednesday evening, we're going to continue on with our engagement project and uh, our studies, and that, that will be on the sermon topic that Terry is, is covering today, and uh, it, it is awesome, I, I will say that. We gave a little preview on the royal task uh, last Wednesday, uh, because I grabbed the wrong DVD and put it in there, I go, wait a minute, this isn't right, <laughs> Lori's going, you got the wrong one. That's wrong. <laughs> so we had a little fun, but we got to see a preview uh, of, of the royal task uh, last Wednesday night. And so please join us for the right one this time on Wednesday night as we do the royal task. Uh, Pastor Terry will be here. I'll be traveling again this week, so uh, I won't be here. But uh, it is an absolute awesome uh, series that we're going through here. And if you miss one week, you miss a lot. You really do. So. If we need to do a catch-up session or something like that, trust me, you don't want to miss it. You didn't want to miss last week's because it was really super. Um, but having said that, we can catch up with those things. Uh, I'm going to throw something in here because I had a call from The Chosen this week. And uh, so they have now got some of the legal wranglings taken care of to where they're able to stream to churches who were licensed previously, which is us. Um, and so I do now have a license for season four uh, that we can stream it. So I, they still haven't sent me out my DVDs or my Blu-rays yet, uh, but we can stream it here for the church. I just have to get that set up for the date. So Terry and I uh, talked about that before church this morning. So we'll get that set up and, and come up with the time when we're gonna be able to start season four and stream that through. So uh, we are fully licensed for it and we're ready to go. So. The neat thing is, I thought it was phenomenal. Uh, our license for this season four is free for us. So they wanted to give it to us for free. So I thought that was, that's huge, trust me. That is huge, free is good. Yeah. Yeah. So next Saturday, men's breakfast is coming up. And of course, we talked about that this morning. Uh, we're gonna attempt. Uh, Biscuits and gravy pizza or breakfast? Ooh. Biscuits and gravy pie. One of the two. So if the pie doesn't turn out, it might turn into pizza. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to have men's breakfast, and that's always a great time to be able to get together and fellowship. Uh, so the great experiment continues. Uh, so that'll be June 1st at 9 a.m. right here. And so we look forward to seeing you there. Then following that up on June 16th, we will be, uh, again, partnering with the Cedar Rapids Freedom Festival for the flag retirement ceremony. And that's when we honor our fallen veterans who have fallen uh, within the Linn County um, for the last year. Then we read all those names off. Last year, we had the largest year ever. Uh, so we read over 307 names, I believe it was, was the final count last year. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a, a telling thing, especially when you're getting up there and uh, starts writing the script and everything for it and then getting up there and actually reading it and reading all those names and it's amazing how many people every year that I know. It makes it really hard, so sometimes I have to switch a name with Terry, <laughs> especially like with my dad from this last year and my Uncle Harvey from the year before, so uh, it's too hard even to read those names. So. Uh, but we will be having that. That will be at Lowe's Park in Marion. That will be on a Sunday, June 16th, which is a, a Father's Day as well, uh, in the afternoon. And so we will be doing that at 4 p.m. 
in Lowe's Park here in Marion. So uh, if you've never been out to that, it is a very moving service. Um, hopefully it will not be burning hot like <laughs> it has been for the last couple of years. Because we're standing, as you can see, we're standing about, uh, oh, maybe five or six feet away from this roaring, blazing fire that's going on. And you're just, you're, you're, uh, it's a sacrifice. Uh, anyway, following up with that on June 13th, we have uh, season 19 of Orange Track Racing. We would normally have racing, uh, but uh, Pastor Terry's gonna be out of town, and so we're switching over and we're gonna have a double header in July. So second Saturday in July, we're gonna have a double header of Orange Track Racing, so it should be a good time anyway. Uh, the Bible mini-series is we're going to be starting that as soon as we finish up the engagement project. We're going to start through the Bible mini-series in here, and so we'll be showing all 10 episodes of that that aired on the History Channel. And so this follows up the Son of God movie, so if those characters on screen look a little bit familiar, mm -hmm. because the movie was derived from this mini-series. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be able to go through that, and then we've got some study materials to go along with that as well. And so it's an awesome, awesome look into the life of Christ and his ministry on earth. So if you're with us online today, please uh, make sure that you click on the tiny URL that we are sending out in the notes. Uh, and that gives you the access then to all of our music for today and our uh, trailers and announcements and those kind of things. So that'll pop up in there too as well. So uh, as we come into that time then, uh, just go ahead and click on that as we are doing it live here. You can do it at home, live, live at home. Yeah, it'll work. Anyway, thank you again for joining us here this morning. And uh, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer as we begin our worship time this morning. Lord God, we ask today on this Holy Trinity Sunday that you send the Holy Spirit to be and abide with us here and dwell within us here today. Lord, we, we praise you and thank you for being in our presence here today. As your word tells us that when two or more are gathered here together in your name, Lord, you are here amongst us and we just praise you and thank you for that today. Lord, we, have, we thank you for the message that you gave Pastor Terry uh, to share with us this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you would just bless him as he comes to give his message and uh, just have us open our ears to hear and our eyes to see the wonders and beauty of the world that you've created for us. Open our hearts to receive the message and to be able to live it out each and every day of our lives as we go forward into this broken world. So Father God, we just praise you and thank you in all these things to be able to gather here together with you freely and openly here this morning and to share in your word. In your precious and holy name we pray today. Our call to worship this morning comes from 1 John 5, 3, and this comes from the New Living Translation. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Now, there are several different translations on this, and, and so uh, this one here talks about them not being burdensome. And uh, it's, it's amazing to see, because if we think about if we keep those commandments, and one of the greatest commandments that Jesus gave us was that we are to love one another and we are to love God with all our uh, soul, mind, heart, and strength and love one another as we love ourselves, love our neighbors. And last week we talked about who our neighbors were, what Dr. Dell Tackett said, who our neighbors were, which means anybody that's within arm's reach at any given point in time is our neighbor. But here John was addressing the church itself, and he was talking about God's community. And so we need to think about that. Um, the church is a community of people who believe in Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah, not just believing in a figurehead, but as the promised Messiah, the person who can be our savior to give us salvation. His death on the cross gave us the way to salvation. As he said, I am, the, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And he had to leave us in order to fulfill that statement. 
And this is what we're talking about, being in community with him. So the church gives us evidence of this belief be, because we believe and obey in God's commands. Understand, we have to believe in them in order to obey them. That's kind of a key thing here. And this obedience to God then comes as a stark contrast, if we think about it, to the world around us that we live in today. Uh, because the world today doesn't come anywhere close to God's commandments whatsoever in any way, shape, or form. But see, then such obedience gives us the ability to overcome the temptations of the world around us as well. And that we then separate ourselves or segregate ourselves from the non-Christians in the world to live by its standards. We live by God's standards instead. So it sets us apart. But it also gives us as a living example of God's commandments when we obey them and sets us up as a living representation of Christ, a representative, represent, or representing Christ to each and every one of those people. And we can obey only as we place our faith and our trust in Christ and not ourselves. And that's another key component of all of this. The motivation for obedience is love of God. And as we learned from last week, this love extends to all other children of God, our neighbors. Trust, obedience, faith, and love thus unite the church into a true community, into the world around us. So we actually are a community within the community of the world. And therefore, we can go as Christ's representatives and help change the world one person at a time as we talk to our neighbors. Mm -hmm. So as we come together and as the church, we can advance our community into the world around us, thus fulfilling the Great Commission, our mission from Jesus Christ, the commandment that he gave. Mm -hmm. And that commandment was to go into all the world and make disciples of all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let's uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we come to you today and we ask for an anointing on each and every one of us as we hear the message today. Come into our hearts and open our hearts to hear and accept the message that Pastor Terry has for us today. We praise you and thank you for that message that you put upon his heart to give us. And so as we continue on in our journey in the, in, in the engagement project here, we ask, Lord, that you would just open our eyes to see these wonders that you blessed us with. We ask that you would open our minds to understand, reveal your special mysteries to us, and enhance our faith as we do. We praise you and thank you in these things. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Oh, well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Well, last week, Mark mentioned that we talked about redemption, and, and we got into that. And it was also the celebration of Pentecost. But what a lot of folks don't know is that Pentecost is immediately followed by another holiday. Christian holiday, which is Trinity Sunday. And on this day, we celebrate the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We've talked about God in the previous messages. We've talked about Jesus in the previous messages. And as we prepare to move into this next tour, we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit. Now, separately, these messages about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are easy to discuss. It's easy to talk about them individually. But while many have heard about the Trinity, understanding it, well, that could be a different thing altogether. Many try to explain the Trinity using different analogies, all of which have the similar effect of Confusing people. Many try to uh, to use 
some sometimes it's using like a clover three leaf clover trying to explain how that all works and it just doesn't work out well in fact i found this a quote uh from a Fred Sanders, who's a theologian, and he said this during a lecture on the doctrine of God. In fact, he has a whole book written on the doctrine of God that touches on the Trinity. But he said the Trinity, try to understand it, and you'll lose your mind. Try to deny it, and you'll lose your soul. Rationally, understanding that the Trinity can be incomprehensible. It's beyond our comprehension. <laughs> Because what we're looking at is three in one. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we end with, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And think about that. When we come to the Father, we do so in the name of the Son, Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, three in one. Each divine, each distinctively one. As we get going this week in our next epic, this one is one in which we live in. And so we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit and how he helps us to live in this epic. And our epic this week is engagement. We'll be also talking about the royal task. Engagement's a word that calls us to do something. Now, when you think about engagement, I immediately, especially since I've got a wedding I'm doing coming up very quickly, frankly, that the water recedes at the venue. But when you think of it, I think of a relationship. I think of a relationship between a man and a woman. A man asks a woman to marry him. And sometimes in this day and age, it might be the woman asking the man. And they become engaged. They have done something. And engagement is the time in which they uh, prepare for marriage. In business, you may have to set a meeting up for dinner. I'm sure Mark's done plenty of these. And we often call those, especially when it's business, a dinner engagement. You've done something. you set up a time to come together to meet and have a meal together while you discuss something. And so an engagement is a promise to give attention to something. It's coming from the word to engage or being engaged. So there's been three questions that we've been going through over the last several weeks. Those three guiding questions are why did Jesus leave? Why are we still here? which I've actually talked to a few people who are near end of life, and they ask me, why, why, why am I still here? And then finally, what is Jesus asking us to do? He's asking us to engage. He's asking us to get busy. He's asking us to do something. So in light of the royal task, we are at that point where we're being given a job. We're being asked to take Jesus' commands and get busy. It's when we take what we've learned about agape love last week. Now, Mark listed off a whole bunch of different types of love. You know, we've got that one type of love that we talk about here, you know, in the English language, which is so watered down. And, you know, a lot of people I say, I love tacos. No, I think you just like them a lot. <laughs> oh, that you truly love them. But we learned about agape love and, and how this will make it happen. And so last week during the message, Mark taught us about the definition of agape love. And I'm going to put it up on the screen again. Agape love is often defined as unconditional, sacrificial love. Agape is the kind of love that is felt by a person willing to do anything for another, including sacrificing themselves without expecting anything in return. In this tour, the object, and we talked about neighbors last week, who our neighbor was, but we're going to give the object of the agape love a name, and that is neighbor. We'll also discover what scripture means when it says that the entire law can be summed up in one word. 
Now, in our call to worship this morning, we heard from 1 John 5, 3. But as always, it's important to look at everything around it to make sure that we're getting the meaning of it. Now, Mark gave us a wonderful explanation of that verse, but I want to read the verses around it as well. So verses 1 through 5 from 1 John 5 say, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. We know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, we have to understand something. Keeping these commandments is not like trying to keep a New Year's resolution. Who's ever kept a New Year's resolution? I mean, really, truly really kept it. I'm going to be honest, I've never been able to. I usually forget what it was. You might have to write it down, but it gets pushed up to the side. And here's the thing, and why that happens? We often take that burden of trying to go it alone. We want to do it ourselves. Remember, a couple weeks ago when I had that little kid going, I want to do myself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, when we try to do things ourselves, we know how that turns out. This is when we need to heed Paul's words when he tells us to put on the full armor of God. Could you imagine, well, you probably can imagine what a day looks like when you don't put on the full armor of God. What happens? You are attacked all day long. The only difference between putting it on and not putting it on is when you don't put it on, those arrows hit. They benefit, they, they get you. Whereas the armor will protect you. And as I was thinking about that, then I, all of a sudden I'm thinking about David. And of course, in my readings this week, I'm in Samuel, so I'm reading about David. In fact, I just read this passage before I put this in here. That's probably why it jumped into my mind. But just as David did against Goliath, we need, we need to fully rely on the strength that only comes from God. Life is difficult. Yep. Our church family, individually and corporately, has been hit hard over the last couple of weeks. But if we're relying on God, our faith will not weigh us down. The instances may pull us down, but our faith will help us get through. That God's commands are not a burden. Think about a parent. And if you're a parent, this will be easy to think about. But if you're not, you have to kind of follow along with this. But as a parent who takes care of their baby, they make sure that the baby is fed, they make sure the baby is clothed, has a clean diaper, and is comfortable. These are not things a parent does because of some command. It's done because of love. Doing these things can cause a parent to become incredibly tired and overwhelmed. But the things that are being done are out of love. Now, I can't, I can only reference this out to the, the moms in the, the audience here. I understand that after a baby's born and you holding the baby and it's crying and you're loving on this little being that all the pain that came before just kind of disappears. It's done out of love. And love is not a burden. In Matthew 11, 25 through 30, Jesus, is, Jesus teaches us how when we come to him that he will give us rest. Everyone who is weary and carries heavy burdens can come to Christ for rest. Let's look at this passage. 
Starts off saying, then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Now the people that Jesus is talking to would be the ones that use the yoke on the animals to do the field work, to pull the carts. But he's also referencing here the legal requirements that the religious leaders would put on the people. Mark touched on this last week. In the Old Testament, there are 613 commandments or mitzvah. Could not him be the only one teaching different words. <laughs> These mitzvah cover many different parts of the daily life, including family diet, personal health, hygiene. And of those, I found this interesting, back in the thir uh, 300s, right around 365, the Maimonides divided those 613 commandments into ones that say, do this, and ones that say, don't do this. There's 240 do this ones, and, or 248 do this, and 365 but don't do this, or do not do this. That's a lot of commandments to uh, remember and keep. We've talked about this before. People can't even remember the easy ones now. You know, stop sign means stop. Yellow means yield. 65 means 65. I follow a guy on social media from who's from England, and he's like, they measure things in distance, right? We measure things in time. And the speed limit, well, that's just a guideline because it's it's it becomes a a contest at how fast you can go to beat that that time. I always found that never thought of it in that way, but he's probably right. For them to travel two hours is a big deal. For many Americans, their commute is two hours to get to work every day. And then I think of Mark in Atlanta when he has to go to Atlanta. That's about right. Maybe three. But other than Jesus, there is not one person, past, present, or future, who could ever perfectly obey every single commandment. Romans 3.23 says, For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. That yoke of those oppressive commands could often be way too much. The yoke Jesus is offering is one that, that still has commandments, I don't want you to think that he's offering just a free ride, because he's not. There's still commandments, but it's easy to bear, and the burden of those commands is light. Remember we said, <coughs> those burdens, it's love, and love is not a burden. All the law points to one commandment, and that's the royal law. And that is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now we're back to the true nature of God and the crown jewel, which is love. In Matthew 22, the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus with a question, and they wanted to best the Sadducees. Because, you know, they, they're religious leaders, but two groups, they, they don't be alone on that mouth. So they, they wanted to best the Sadducees, whom Jesus had already silenced when they questioned him about the resurrection of the dead. In verse 36, they would ask, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And when we look at 37 through 40, he answers them. Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. He's quoting from Deuteronomy 6 5. And he wasted no time in identifying the first and greatest commandment, but he follows it with a second. He says, A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the commands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So if we love God, then we will just follow his commandments. When we truly look at the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses, 
They're all commandments to love God. Jesus said if we truly love God and our neighbor, we will naturally keep those commandments. And it is also important to note that Jesus tells us that this love for God is with our entire being, all of us. We cannot give Jesus or God a part of it and give another part to the world. Scripture tells us we can't have two masters. Pastor Mark mentioned last week that the world, the word love has been watered down, and it really has. People use words casually or even insincerely. If you've ever been down south or you've watched something, you may have heard someone say, oh, bless your dear heart. <laughs> now, if you're not from the south, you think, oh, that's so sweet. Sorry. Yeah. That is not <laughs> sweet. It is not a compliment. No. Don't take it as such if you're talking to somebody from the south. But bless your dear heart is... It can mean a few different things, but it is not a compliment. Let's get back to that a copy love. Because that that statement has nothing to do with a copy love, but Mark and I both defined it as unconditional sacrificial love. So if we look at this agape love is a sacrificial zeal that seeks the true good of another. And it's by allowing the Holy Spirit to work in and through us that we can truly love our neighbor. Now the neighbor we're talking about is the person next door across the street. Now for those of you who are asking, aren't we supposed to love God first? I would say loving others is loving God. Because we're following his command, we're actually loving God. And if you're thinking about the Great Commission where Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all the nations, I would say you need to start somewhere and we're better than your own backyard. And you can ask all the questions you want, find all the excuses you can, but the reality is that more often than not, we're just unwilling to put ourselves out there. How many of you think that uh, developing that relationship with that neighbor, person next door, across the street, well, that's a scary thought, especially for the introverts in the group, right? I don't want to talk to anybody. But here's what it does. It makes us vulnerable. And in, in the series, Dr. Tack has been talking about our our script, right? Everything that we have. Remember the, the script where we see mom and, and she's got her script and each of the kids have their script and the dad has his script and everybody's doing what they think it should be. So it gets in the way of the way, things that we think and the way we want them to go. And there we go. We put the yoke on ourselves, not taking the one that Jesus is offering. In Judges 16, as Samson is on his way to Timnah, he is confronted by a young lion. This is when we put the yoke, take the yoke of Jesus, right? At that moment, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, and he ripped the lion's jaws apart with his bare hands. In 1 Samuel 16, God had sent Samuel to anoint the next king over Israel. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of oil, olive oil, that he had brought and anointed David with the oil, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. In John 14, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. He promises that we will have the Spirit of the Lord come powerfully on us. And then here Jesus says, If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. 
was on that day of Pentecost last week that the Holy Spirit came powerfully on the disciples. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They were able to talk so that the people there understood the message. And then Peter, who if you remember, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, denied him three times. Kind of popped into his own script, tried to do things on his own. Well, on this day, he would address the people. And by the power of the Holy Spirit coming powerfully upon him, he would preach a most powerful sermon. Mark mentioned last week it was somewhere in the neighborhood of four hours, not going that long last week, not going that long this week. But that's what happens when we take this yoke that Jesus offers. The Holy Spirit will come powerfully on you as well. And yes, we are going to go through trials. I mentioned earlier that several of here have gone through their own trials, lost family members this past couple of weeks. And it's hard, and the tears will still come. The tears get fewer, the pain doesn't go away. But the power of the Holy Spirit will lead us, convict us, teach us and equip us to do the work that Jesus has commanded us to do. God, just making sure y'all is awake. <laughs> That's right. Wake us all up. Well, I was yesterday. I was doing a little tweaking to the sermon as the Lord led, and Diane's in the living room listening to some Scottish bagpipes as she's getting some things ready for the service this week, and um, all of a sudden I hear this boom, boom, shaking the room I was in, and I went out to the front door and I opened it up. And I stood there for a few seconds and went away. She goes, is it me? I said, no, it coming from outside. Where? I look up, I look down, there's nobody. So somebody in the neighborhood that we couldn't see had the bass turned up yeah. and it was way worse than that. Yeah. That wasn't the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but these things that the power leads us to do, the conviction, the teaching, the equipping, the leading, those are things we can't take lightly. You may be called to speak to thousands, just like Peter was. You may be called, like most of us, to speak one person at a time. Neighbor in the backyard. When we start in our own backyard with one person, that person then goes on to talk to someone else. And pretty soon you've got this going on where that person tells someone and that person tells someone. And while you may not get to another part of the world to go and make disciples, as the Jesus is, and says, you may just reach it one person at a time. At some point down the road, the people that hear from that one conversation you had We'll go places that we can't go, or never will go. It's said that in the late 1800s, a group of six men met, met for a Bible study. And eventually, 
from that Bible study, one would talk, to teach someone else, and that someone else would go on to do tent revivals in the early 1900s. And it's during one of those revivals when a 15-year-old Billy Graham would give his life to Christ. From six men who loved God and their families to a teenager who would be used by God to reach millions. That one conversation you have. You don't know where it's going to go. That divine appointment that God has set for you, you don't know where that's going to end up. And that's just one story of thousands upon thousands of how one person or a small group of people made a difference for the kingdom because they accepted the royal task. There's a church out in D.C. that they were this big church and they saw themselves losing their vision and they shrunk themselves, became like house churches. And they are doing more for the kingdom as those small individual churches than they were doing for the kingdom as the one big church. It's not always about size. As Christians, we need to be willing to love our neighbors with that agape love. If we commit to loving our neighbors, we can turn this upside down world right side up one neighbor at a time. Are you ready to accept the royal task? Now this morning as we close out our time with the message, because it is Trinity Sunday, Oftentimes, the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed are read. And as I looked at both of them and I prayed over both of them, I looked at them and I'm going, well, the Apostles' Creed's a lot shorter. But the meat, the message in the Nicene Creed. So I invite you to read this creed with me. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us, and for sorry oh I'm sorry nope for our salvation he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human for our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate he suffered death and was buried on the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. talking a few weeks ago, I talked about the agape love, and I talked about Christ on the cross, and I told you then that the ropes and the, the nails were not what held Christ to the cross, but it was love, it was that agape love, that, that love that has no end, that love that is eternal. It has enough love to surround the entire universe. Because God created that entire universe. And as we think about this today, and we think about the sacrifice that Christ made for us, we think then again back to that basis of love. 
And as he has commanded us to go forth into the world, we're to do so in love for our neighbors. So he didn't want us to keep that love that he gave to us on the cross to ourselves. He wants us to go into the world and share that love with everyone else. And sometimes, like I said last week, it's really hard to love your neighbor. But at the same time, it's no harder than what he did on the cross for us. Sometimes we think our burdens are heavy and our burdens are too much for us to bear. But think about the burden that he bore to get to the cross and then to have that sacrificial love, that agape sacrificial love on the cross so that everyone, the neighbor that you don't like, that's hard to love able to have that love. That's what we do when we come to communion. See, we're called to remember that sacrificial love that Christ had for us and for all. For all. That's the key. So, as we come into this time today, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. It's important part of that sacrifice that we were talking about. Later on in the meal, he took the cup, and after he filled the cup, he blessed the cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And as we do so, we are called into remembrance of that sacrifice that Christ made for us on the cross back then. And it is the same sacrifice that we celebrate here today. The body of Christ broken for you today. And the blood of Christ shed for you take and drink. And as always, thanks be to God. back in the town. So this morning we have lots to pray about. We've lost lots of people this week. And I'm going to just read out their names before I start and then pray a blanket prayer for all of them. But before we start, is there anyone that needs prayer this morning other than that? And yes, Tom? Can we just add some prayers to the families that had the bad weather and the tornadoes? Oh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to pray for them. Bad situation, so yes, they I will. Some extra prayers, I'd say. Absolutely, yes, we're going to add those in this morning. And first I want to um, thank God for a beautiful addition to Lynette's family last night. She had a great-grandson, and uh, so praise God for him. And we just pray blessings upon him, in Jesus' name. Okay, so the ones we have lost this week. And if, if I miss somebody, please shout out their name. And we've been praying for them, and we thank God for them. Diane and Terry's mom, Ann McDill. Steve's brother, Larry Westerhoff. Friends of the church, Sherry Wallace, Wendy Barton, and Louis Serta. And Mark's classmate, Sid Sampson. So let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we come into your house today to acknowledge you and praise and worship, to honor you in all we do, because the universe is yours. As in Psalms 24, 1 and 2, 4 and 5 state, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he formed it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol, or swear by what is false, he will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God our Savior. Father God, we hear your words this morning. Help us to apply them to our daily lives. For we are just flesh and blood, but we were created in your image to give honor, praise, and glory to your name. In this world, too many people have created for themselves idols. They worship money, 
power, and themselves. And they worship anything but you, God. Without reading your word, they listen to others, then do and act without knowledge, without any thought of how it Im impacts their lives and the lives of others as well. Open the eyes of those who don't and can't see you, and open their ears so they can hear your voice to guide America back to you, Father God. Let your Bible be the guide that people seek. I pray this for this generation and the generations to come. We need you back in our hearts, minds, homes, and schools, O oh God. Thank you for your unconditional love for your people. Father God, we thank you and praise you for the people that have entered into your kingdom this week. Their days of suffering here on earth are over. We thank you for their lives, and we thank you for the times we got to spend here with them and all the blessings we receive just knowing them. <clears throat> Please comfort the hearts of the families that have lost some someone they love this week. Put Christian people in their path to remind them that you are God and through you all things happen. We can't fathom the height and depth of your love, so help us to trust you in all things, that we seek your face in troubled times, and you alone will give us the peace that passes all understanding. And as we walk through the valley of sadness, Help us to feel your presence of the Holy Spirit abiding in us each and every day. Let us be still, God, and know that you are God. Father God, for those here and online suffering from cancer or illness or burdens of the flesh and bone, we ask Yahweh Rapha, the God that heals, to intervene in their lives and to heal their bodies as only you can. Give wisdom to doctors and nurses to give them the help they need to be on the right path to healing. Walk with them daily through their trials and be ever-present help in their times of troubles. We ask for guidance for our children and grandchildren. Hold on to them always and bring them back to you. We ask for help for the homeless to lift them up and out of their current situations, bring a renewed spirit into their lives and give them hope for a brighter future. Father God, we seek your help and guidance and hope for those in the towns of Greenfield and Grapevine, Texas, and all who are cleaning up after our devastating tornadoes this week. Father, you give and you take away, and you restore bigger and better than before. Help the people to unite together to help each other through this storm in their lives. May you revive their hearts and minds Help them to see you and know that you are right there with them to restore their lives. For you will never leave us and you will never forsake us if we turn to you and know you are the God who saves us through every trial and every storm. You are our shepherd. Guide us in the ways of everlasting. For your great love endures forever. For you are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I love technical difficulties. <laughs> Thank you so much for your service. Mm -hmm. We all need them so much. As we prepare to close our online portion of the service today, I would pray a prayer because tomorrow is Memorial Day. Heavenly Father, today we thank you for the freedom you have given us. We thank you for the freedom you have given us from sin by the sacrifice that your son Jesus paid on the cross. Father, we also thank you for the brave men and women who have fought for and continue to fight for our nation. We especially thank you this day for those men and women who paid the ultimate sacrifice for our nation's freedom. We also ask that you would bless their families. Give them your comfort and peace. Thank you that in a nation today, we are able to freely worship, we are able to freely pray, 
to freely read your word and so many other freedoms. But Father God, we know that at any time, those freedoms could be lost, stripped away. Lord, we know that we're in a spiritual battle. Help us to have the same courage as those who went before us. Empower us by your Holy Spirit to get out of our own script, to turn over our yoke and give it to Jesus and take upon his. So one person at a time, we can truly turn this upside down world right side up. Thank you that you have promised never to leave us or forsake us. We pray all of this in Jesus' mighty name.